So we all have um, a common denominator here, and the the one common de denominator that we have is that we all have some Puerto Rican backgrounds and roots. So I think that's something that all of us want to know is how, how connected are you, a first-generation Puerto Rican or first-generation uh, born in Brooklyn, New York. I'm one of five. I'm the oldest, and I was the first one uh, to go to college in, in my family. My grandmother had uh, 13 kids, and they were farmers, and then my grandfather's family, I don't know how many they had, but um, first generation, very proud. My first language was Spanish because both my parents spoke Spanish, uh, and I learned English in school, so it was like the typical, um, what is it, a Puerto Rican that came to New York in the 50s. My parents came to New York City during the 50s when there was a lot of animosity with new groups coming in, so I know that whole story. So, yes, that's my background. So reading about your biography, we noted that you were a banker. I was a banker as well for many okay. years, so we have that in common. Was there any point in banking or before that that you knew that you wanted to be a judge? You know, I always thought it was when I graduated from undergraduate and a lot of my family rem members again growing up with a lot of family and we have family reunions um, every so often in New York and it's great to get together with many cousins that I don't even know but the ones that grew up with me remind me oh yes you know they remember when I was a little kid that I would say yeah you know I like to talk and I like to argue and that I always wanted to be a lawyer um, so, I, you know, I didn't do the traditional road, um, undergraduate, you finish, and then you go on to a law school. Again, I was the oldest of five, and I, you know, my parents worked hard, so I came back home, and I helped my parents so my other brothers and sisters can go to school. So that's what I ended up doing. I ended up getting a job offer at a banking, a large bank at the time. I entered their management training program, so I was um, with my parents in Connecticut, and then my other brothers and sisters went to school. And when they finished, then I applied to law school, and you know, history. Then that's it. That I went to NYU. That's awesome to hear. So, speaking of, it sounds to me like it's relatable to me, and I'm sure to a lot of us that. Going through the path of education can be a tough one. Are you a first generation graduate in your school or do your parents have degrees? In my, uh, my, in my case, it's, that's not the case for my mom. I was the first actually to graduate. When we left, when we left New York City, because that's where I was born, I was born in Brooklyn. I'm very proud of that. I used to hide the fact. But I see of all the famous people that you know come from Brooklyn and like, you know, um, like they say, I have chutzpah. That means I've got the stamina and the guts, if you want to say. So I, you know, I, I take part of that and my heritage. Um, and so when my parents moved to Connecticut, because we had family from Puerto Rico that went to Connecticut um, there, and that's where I was basically um, went to middle school and high school. Uh, my father, while he was working, ended up getting an associate's degree, so he did try to. But he was also, again, trying to maintain and feed uh, five of us, so it was hard, but I think he tried um, going on for higher education. My mom was the traditional um, homemaker, staying at home with five kids, driving us uh, to school, and we were in every activity you can imagine, you know, in school. My brothers played football. I was more of a geek. I did, uh, like, the Glee Club. Now it's popular, but back then, you know, it wasn't so... Um, what is it, uh, beautiful to be in the Glee Club, and I did acting and all that, so in the government, I was very involved with the government, so my poor mom did a lot of the driving for all of us while my father worked maybe two jobs and then going to school at night. So would, would you say there's some um, habits that you had to adopt so that you could emerge and sort of break the ceiling for your family? Um, I almost feel like sometimes when you come from not privilege, you have that passion, that drive that's unparalleled to anything I've ever seen. You know, I have to say I get a lot of that, and, you know, when I look at my other brothers and sisters, we get that from my parents. I mean, I, 
I look at my parents and I, I always get emotional when I talk about them because they're, they're alive, thank God. But I think all of us have been successful. And, you know, I come from a working class family, but we've all been very successful because we saw my parents, they worked hard. And when you see parents that work so hard and they sac we were number one. And I think it's, it's the combination of seeing how hard they work and how important they, they always led us to know that education was important and the gateway to any advancement would be education. You know, again, I, I, I credit them. I mean, it's, and, and all my brothers and sisters will say the same thing. The odd of raising a family of five children and that we all have our master's degrees at least, that's a credit to my parents, absolutely, and their hard work and what was important to them. And I, that's part of it comes because of them. So we, I'm sure that you have lots of families uh, in your courtroom that come from similar backgrounds mm -hmm. than the one that you have experienced. Okay. And when they present obstacles of why they're not thriving, how do you observe that? You know, you go, you evolve in life. And I can tell you this is my second what I call tour of duty. I'm in family court. I sit now in, in the family division. Six years ago, uh, when I was in the family division, I was of a different season, if you want to say that, uh, state of mind. Uh, my children at the time were younger. And so my state of mind and the way I viewed or the lenses that I viewed, the experiences that came, came before me were very different than now. Fast forwarding six, seven years later, I have teenage daughters now. I've experienced a lot more. I don't have such a myopic, a myopic view, meaning um, I, I try not to impose my view of the obstacles that they're presenting me. So that's how I see myself evolving. I, I keep more of an open mind, you know, seeing my own struggles with, you know, again, um, from the way I was raised to raising my own family and as I evolved. And I hope and I think I have a larger lens. I try not to impose my own implicit bias. I think I recognize and I catch myself if I start thinking, um, well, you know, why aren't they doing this? I, I really try to keep an open mind until I've heard all the information to ultimately make a decision, which I have to do at the end of a case. So to answer your question in a rather roundabout way, um, I believe I've evolved a lot more and I'm not um, making decisions about the obstacles that people are going through. And so hopefully it is the individuals that appear before me that try to educate me in explaining what it is that they're going through and why, why is it that they can't seem to go to the next step. That's awesome that you could remove yourself and think differently. That would be a challenge to me. Um, in an era right now that we live, that everything, there's such transparency right now with all the media. Like right now, so many people will be watching this video um, because of the media that, that's in place these days. We see so many things uh, that perhaps were happening before, but we were not seeing before. So for example, in an era where now they have come up with hashtag me too. Um, so it's topics that are now being spoken about. Preparing for uh, this short interview with you with this chat, I did do a lot of research about specific judges that I like in, in the case, in my, my particular case, Sonia Sotomayor, and I did see that she made a comment about having a counterpart call her a word that to her was rather belittling. And he didn't, although he didn't have any intention, she felt compelled to bring it up. Have you ever felt that as a female, you're treated differently. Absolutely, even on the bench. And I think people are usually um, surprised when I mention that, that we get treated differently, we do. I mean, I remember um, my first few years on the bench, I've been on the bench now going 10 years, um, and I've had 
colleagues, male colleagues, I would say sneak in, and even friends of mine come in and just watch. Give me some feedback. Tell me what, if anything, um, I may be doing wrong. And after I get the feedback, I realize they said, these people would never do that to me. These are my male colleagues. Uh, for example, I'll give you some examples of what we're talking about. Uh, the fact to, that I get called ma'am when it's, I know for the male counterparts, they would never say sir. It's usually your honor or judge. But I get called ma'am. And so, and, and you know, and I've got other male colleagues that will talk to, to me and will say, you know, um, what's the comment that I heard? Um, oh, okay, kiddo. And, you know, you, another colleague, and, you know, again, I don't think that was meant to be degrading, demeaning, or anything like that. Again, that, that, these are things that people need to check themselves, and especially now in, the, in, in, in light of the Me Too movement and just the awareness of what's going on and the words that you use. When you say that to someone of apparent equal standing, that, that, that is degrading. It, it is. And people do say things, um, and in this case, again, it wasn't intentional, uh, but there are many times that it is intentional, and I've had it um, said to me either on the bench or off the bench. And so you have to decide how you're going to deal with it and, and what I've done. And I know you were relating earlier, and you didn't want to get into it, how uh, Justice Sotomayor dealt with it. Um, I, I agree, which is when you have something like that, I don't believe in uh, embarrassing anyone, um, but I do believe you do need to deal with that immediately. So what I, I've done with, with individuals that say things that are rather offensive, I will tell them, look, let me speak to you, usually in private. I mean, that's the best way to handle it. There's no need to embarrass anyone, even though you know, what they may have said to you um, could be uh, demeaning. And I've had people say things publicly with an audience, um, and the intent was clearly uh, to belittle me, belittle my, the office, and belittle the fact that I happen to be a female and I happen to look young. Um, and so with individuals like that, they may not get the courtesy of having a private conversation because at that point in time, if there's an audience, I've got to let them know. I sit here not as me, Migna Sanchez, Urenz, but I sit here out of, um, and I wear the robe and I take an oath, so it's the respect of the office. It has nothing to do with my ego, but it's the respect of the office. So if there's someone that comes before me and there's an audience out of respect for the office, absolutely, I will handle that immediately with them. And that is the proper thing to do. I would not apologize at all because at that point, it is not me, the person speaking, but it is the office that I have the absolute honor to be sitting in. So I have to make sure that that office is respected. That's fair enough. So with only four women in our history having ever been appointed to the Supreme Court, and we've already addressed the gender gap, yeah. what are your particular advices to women that aspire, maybe like yourself, to one day be in that high judge court? What I would recommend to them or? What is your advice in general? In general? For women that aspire, that may be watching a 12 year old that would say, one day I wanna be her. I mean, you have to work really hard. I mean, this is a vocation. It's it's a life work, it really is. You have to have the passion. I tell my interns, I love having interns year round. As a matter of fact, I have an intern out there and I'm gonna do a shout out for Mark uh, Ayala Berrios, Oberios Ayala, I'm sorry that I, I forgot. They do the same thing to me on my hyphenated name, but I love, and the one thing I tell each and every one of the interns that work with me and assist me, because that's what I call they truly assist me, is that you have to love what you do. You can't fake it because this job requires you to put in lots of hours. And so first and foremost, make sure you're in the area where you actually have a passion in and you don't not mind working the hours that you need to work because you're going to put in a lot of hours. I can tell you my first year as an assistant public defender, I worked seven days a week and I did 22 trials in a year and my 
back then he was my uh, fiance, but my husband worked at a private firm, and I can tell you I worked more billable billable hours than he did it and I was a public servant and I was not getting paid for the overtime but I had the passion and I worked really hard so first and foremost the passion number two what I would advise is going to people um, find a mentor who you respect someone who's got a very good reputation and who will have your back because that's incredibly important your reputation um, will go a long way and I tell this to each and every one of my interns, the reputation is incredibly in important. Whether you're in New York City or you're here in, in uh, Miami-Dade County, people talk, everyone knows your reputation. They know whether you're a hard worker. They know whether or not um, you're going to de do the work. They're gonna know whether or not you're accountable. Um, so all that is really important and that's through a mentor. So if you've got someone who is helping you through this process. They can also help you connect with other uh, individuals. And for women, women especially, you know, get other women of like minds because unfortunately women, I hate to say this, I went to a women's school. My daughters, I've sent them to a girls' school too. I truly believe in the whole single sex education. I do because there's something to be said about that. And you learn uh, the girls, um, you know, the one thing I, I don't think women have, have really gotten what our male counterparts have done is the camaraderie. I, I still feel women still cut each other down. We still haven't learned to be like our uh, male counterparts, which is helping one another um, and working with one another. And I find that I have a lot of women friends who I truly depend on, where each other, we've got each other's back. So find women like that that you know will have your back no matter what, that they're encouraging you and that you're, they're your cheerleaders. You, you, you need that in every walk of life. So those are the three main things that I would definitely. Who did you recommend. admire? Who, who was your mentor going through, either growing up or coming through this career, your career path? I've, had, I, I've been very blessed. I've had a number of really good people in my path. You know, I think back. You know, I have to say, I always have to say first and foremost, my parents, they were just, you know, you can tell. I, I do worship the ground my parents work <laughs> on. I just think they're the best thing in our lives. And I think my brothers and sisters will say the th same thing. They are truly uh, my model. I mean, that's why I don't understand children nowadays. They have heroes and all that. They're my heroes, first and foremost. So moving on from there, I was lucky through high school. I had amazing uh, counselors. I remember having a Puerto Rican counselor I went to a uh, working class high school in Connecticut um, and uh, we were very fortunate. I, had, I happened to have a Puerto Rican counselor. He went to Yale and he gave me incredible advice. I mean, he was telling me, look, you're smart enough. He, he was one of the first I remember encouraging me. Um, I had a teacher in, uh, I remember my English teacher in high school also. I, uh, you know, he was just, great encouraging me to you know look i can do this um people like that along the way uh fast forward now um i have a number of people that uh, i'm trying to think um in the workplace um i've had people that um supervisors that knew what i wanted to do and again were encouraging me and uh, my life partner who happens to be my husband and i met him in law school uh, back in uh, 1990, and I'm still with him, so it's like 25 years. We went to our 25, 25th year reunion. Congrats. It's, thank you. <laughs> it's important to have a partner who understands what it is that you do and that sometimes you're not around. And um, when you have a partner like that, a life partner like that, that can take care of the kids and not have his ego offended because he's the male who enjoys cooking and can blow dry the hair when my girls were small, that's amazing. So <laughs> it is, it is, it is. Not so, long ago, I don't know how much of uh, social media you watch or television, but it was a large, largely very public uh, scene of, I believe he was actually a lawyer in New York City who spoke down to some workers because they were speaking Spanish. Now, that. not too long ago, about a month ago, I have a daughter, a 20-year-old daughter, and she works for a department store. And my daughter came home 
very upset telling me that a lady went off on her because she was speaking Spanish to a coworker mm. of hers. And I think we're seeing a lot of that lately. What are your thoughts on, on that particular issue? Well, we're a country made of, of immigrants and, and Puerto Ricans, we know we're not immigrants and I always have to remind people we are part of the US. So um, we have diverse cultures. I grew up speaking, like I told you, Spanish was my first language. Um, I speak to my children in Spanish and I, I think it just, it's education. It's educating the people. I mean, we're a country that, you know, the way I was raised, a country of, people that are tolerant. I have seen it changed. And I, again, I think it all goes back to education. Um, and, you know, what do I feel? I mean, in terms of, you know, the politics of it, you know, I really can't get into much of that because again, if issues like that come before me, um, there's something called a recusal that if anyone suspects that you have strong feelings one way or another about the issue, they would want me off the case. So, you know, what I can tell you about that is this. Whatever the law of the land is, I'm gonna follow. What my personal feelings are, are my personal feelings, and I believe I have them very much in check. Um, and so, you know, as to the personal aspect of it, I, I truly believe in what this country uh, was founded on and, and, you know, all these mixed cultures. And again, I, I just think it goes back to educating and um, having people just be a little bit more tolerant. So you've never felt in any kind of a way, because I know I, I went to college in Virginia and it was the very first time in my life that I felt inadequate. And I tell you why, because I was not white or black. I was right. something different. Have you ever had a moment Absolutely. in your life where you felt or someone made you feel rather inadequate for being Latina. Absolutely. I was raised in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start off with that, and I love Connecticut, I do. Um, but absolutely, but you know what that did for me? I used to hear this uh, back in Connecticut because I know the Puerto Rican in Hartford, uh, Connecticut was very working class, there were a lot of gangs, and there was a lot of negative things being said about Puerto Ricans, and that was always in the paper. Um, and at that time, I had been working in the banking industry, and I remember I, it was a lunch conversation, and someone was really disparaging the Puerto Ricans, and I finally got up, and I never stay shut about this. I'm always proud. I mean, the one beautiful thing about my parents, I'm proud being Puerto Rican, and I will never stop saying that I'm Puerto Rican, first and foremost, and I try to teach my children that as well. But I remember telling someone, hey, by the way, do you know I am Puerto Rican and I'm not like those people? Oh, well, you know, I think they were taken aback. And I've, I've made that statement to several people uh, in a lot of areas of my life, you know, from the high school to the workplace, which it's happened many times. And I would tell them, well, you don't look it. And I, and I would say, first and foremost, what, what do you mean I don't look it? Uh, you don't speak like it. Well, what do you mean I don't speak like it? Because I'm educated, because I work hard? I'm not Puerto Rican? Are you saying we're all alike? I, you know, and I would stop that. Of course I, I felt that. And, and I've had to deal with it. And you know, I, I'm from a large family, so we don't all look the same way. And you know, we're all mixed. I mean, we are, I, I, you know, I told my husband being Cuban, I told my husband, we're the rainbow coalition in our family because he went to a first family reunion in New York and I said, we have very many different colors and nationality in our, you know, in our family. And, um, and I said, and we all don't look alike. Um, I've got a brother who looks very, how people describe very Caribbean looking, whatever that means. I have a brother with <laughs> kinky hair or what they say, you know, pelo malo, you know? Um, and Which that's so a wonderful I, thing, actually. I find I, it I think it's the, wonderful, it, but, but people are taken aback when they meet your family. And it's like, that's your family? I go, yeah, we're a good mix. You know, that's what we are. And so, yeah, no, I mean, that we've all, you know, I not only, I have not only personally felt it, my brothers and sisters have personally felt it, but I think the way we fought it back is that you teach them you're smarter, you work harder, and you show them, hey, this is who I am. And you know, that really shuts them up. I mean, I, I, that's how I've done it. I think it, for me, it gives me the fuerza, the impetus to like, I'm going to work harder and I'm going to be better. 
Period. It sort of lights a fire in your belly. Oh, right? it, it like, just it like if, if, if you want to get me going, oh yeah, just say something, that, and I'm gonna prove to you double, triple. So yeah, that's how that's how I've dealt with it, and I think my brothers and sisters have dealt with it the same the same way. Because my brother, who's darker, happens to be a darker uh, Puerto Rican. They've always thought he was black, and he would say, "No, I'm Puerto Rican." You know, I'm like, you know, we all look differently, you know, type of thing. So yeah. Yes, in my case, I viewed it as a great opportunity to talk to my daughter and have Absolutely. the discussion, not to put her head down because of her roots and her Absolutely. heritage and who she is. Do you speak to your daughters about who they are? Absolutely, and, and never, you know, feel ashamed. And, you know, and I think um, what's wonderful about that, because I grew up, again, in the environment up in the Northeast where we were in the minority, um, and I grew up in the suburbs of Connecticut. And people didn't know exactly what we were. They thought I was either Jewish. If they met me, I was either Jewish, Greek, or Italian, because that's all they knew. And then I'd speak Spanish and tell them, no, let me tell you about Puerto Ricans and who we are and, and et cetera. Um, and my daughters have had the benefit of growing up in Miami where everyone speaks Spanish. I, I didn't have that. I didn't grow up with that. I grew up almost with um, a chip and having to work harder, you know, because of the being the minority in that. And so I think my daughters, when they go up, um, when they travel with me up north, I think they're always shocked that, you know, no, it's not my, we're, no, we're not in Miami anymore, you know, and I tell you, you're right, you're not in Miami anymore. And I let them know and don't, you know, ever let anyone make you feel any differently. Be proud. You know, you speak Spanish, you speak Spanish. There's not an issue with that and, you know, et cetera. And so that's when the education part comes into play. You just mentioned something that you worked harder. Do you feel you still today have to work harder? Yes, for a number of reasons. I think it comes in um, not so much being in Miami, being Hispanic, because, again, we're the majority here. I think it's more on the woman's side. I just think being a female, I, I do feel like I always have to work two, three times more than the counterpart. And yeah, there's always that feeling of second class as a female. And I hate to say that, you know, we have not progressed as much as I, I would have thought. So yeah. Are there any life hacks that you have and you could share with us and the people that are watching us? That like, gets you through your day. You have to, love, you mentioned that you have to, especially in the beginning of your career, work so hard, so many hours. And women, now that we're discussing the women issue, I often feel that men have one goal, and that goal is very powerful to be, and it nor normally translates to have wealth. For us women, it's often time, at least from my women and my friends' perspective, to so many other things, to be the greatest mom that you could be, to be the greatest sister, and then you have your professional career, that we have to have a life hack, something that, that works for our family, for our ambitions. What are yours? It's true. We women wear a lot of different hats, you know, especially when we're working and we have demanding jobs. Because first and foremost, if you are a mom, I'm still number I'm still number one. I'm a mom and I have a responsibility to my daughters. And that goes hand in hand with what I do, because I'm showing them through my experience um, that I, you know, that I can work that I can still be a mom, that I can still have friends outside of the home. And I do that. And I try to teach them balance. Um, I pray that that's the um, example that I'm giving them, knowing that they can do it. They can do it um, all, not always at 100%, um, but that there may be sacrifices and that there are certain things that they may need to ease up a bit. And so I, I hope what I... What gets me through is knowing that I have two daughters that are watching me, um, watching how I handle life. Because at the end of the day, who else are they going to go to as they get older? Um, they're, one of them is going to university uh, next year. And so they're going to have to rely on, on models that they've seen. And I'm hoping that I'm one of the models that they remember that, you know, they had a mom who worked, enjoyed what she love to do so hopefully that love passion you know they find that i 
I have a um, that you have a partner that's encouraging you with whatever you happen to do, um, and so that's my um, go-to. I mean, the fact you know it weighs heavily that I have two daughters, and I want them, and I hope they see um, the good examples that I've I've hope I've set for myself. But the main thing is mainly my daughters, and what gets me through a, a, a tough day to answer that. You know, I happen to be um, a woman of, of faith, so I have a lot of faith, and I have a lot of quiet moment. I have, I, I do what they call espacio, and I just take a lot of contemplative moments to think about things, have my um, emotions in check, and that's incredibly important, and that's what keeps me solid. Awesome. So you believe you're meditating? meditation well I, I meditate but you know I am a woman of faith so I mean I, I go to that so but but that involves a lot of different things but yes do you how do you define success what is success to you success is family at the end of the day is you know that I am there for my family my family's there for me um, that I'm doing an, a, a good job with the information that I have. I'm giving it my all. You know, I stay working. At the, and the day that I can't give my 110%, then I shouldn't be doing it. And so I enjoy what I do. I try to give everybody the best that I can and, um, you know, hear people out. I mean, that's, to me, a success. You just reminded me of something that I posted not, not long ago on my Instagram page. And I found and I loved, and it was Maya Angelou's definition of success, which is love yourself, love what you do, and love how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> she couldn't have said it any better. That's why she's Maya Angelou. <laughs> so we're, we're going to take three questions from the audience at this point. So I know that they pre-interviewed you pretty much. <laughs> But I'm sure that some people in the audience may have a question for you. So if you do, um, raise your hand. Don't be shy, guys. You were asking her a ton of questions. Okay, if you want to first say who you are. Congrats. Where did she go to school? She's over at George Washington University. Okay. She grew up in Puerto Rico and went to the system, ended up in D.C. and she grew up from there. But um, this is more a, a question. Being a judge is quite different from, from a lawyer. We used to say that faith and life will affect many lives on a decision. Absolutely. No, that, that is absolutely correct, um, and I've gone through many of the divisions. I'll tell you, in criminal, when I sat as a judge in the criminal division, one of the hardest part of the job was sentencing, when you had to sentence someone, because, again, you're hearing from the victim, the victim's family, and, and if it's, uh, um, depending on the type of case, then you look at the facts of, of the, uh, the case, and then you have to figure out uh, what is the just sentence because in criminal it's that it's just because quite frankly look anyone can give a maximum sentence you don't need a judge for that then you might as well have a computer everyone that comes before you give them max okay that is not the role of a judge the role of the judge is what you say what is just given the facts of those cases and so on the criminal end you know you have the sentencing now that I'm in family again this is my second um, uh, time back in family, um, I'm dealing with families like you're saying and the decisions in deciding should I take the child away from dad and give it to mom? Should I take the child away from mom and give it to dad, which I just did today? You know, most people think, oh, you know, she does it easily. Listen, it weighs on me. 
look, at the end of the day, I, like every one of you, you know, I eat, I sleep, I bleed, you know, and things bother me. But the one thing I've learned, luckily, in my almost 10 years sitting as a judge, I can't bring this home. And so what I do, you know, dovetailing back to your question, I, I do yoga and I do a lot of running. I run in the mornings awesome. <laughs> and I do go to yoga and that breathing, the breathing definitely helps. And I have a lot of uh, quiet time and I, I really like to be thoughtful. I think and I believe I'm very thoughtful about the decisions I make. I just don't, you know, it's not just haphazardly that I ultimately make a decision. It's that I've thought everything out given the information that comes before you because remember I can only make a decision with the information that they bring me if there's some other information out there that everyone knows about but the judge does not you can't blame the judge if ultimately I make a decision and I don't have the information so depending on the information that comes before me yeah I, I know and it's not easy and there are times that you know being human um, the reality is that sometimes you have people that come before you that you don't like. They're not nice people. And so what I do in situations like that, I recognize that that's rec this is what happens when you evolve and you recognize and you know the kind of person that you are. You want to do what's just and what's fair and what the law tells you to do. So on cases like that that I really truly want to think about it and make sure my feelings are in check, and that I am going solely on what the law says and what the facts were presented before me, what I usually would, will do is take the decision under advisement, meaning, ladies and gentlemen, I've heard everything. I want to think about it. I'm going to have you call me back in two weeks, and I will tell you what my decision is, and then I write an order. I do that for a couple of reasons, to keep my emotions in check, that whatever decision I make, is not a decision based on feelings at the time, but based on the best decision given the information that I have before me, along with what the law says I can do or cannot do. And so that's what I try to do in the most difficult cases that I have. You're not gonna get me making a decision right then and there. You will usually hear me, I'm gonna take this under advisement. And normally what I do, I use a lot of my interns for that to do the research, we sit down, and if they're out there watching with me, I interact with my interns. It's like being in law school, well, what did you think? What did you, know, what did you think about this information that they gave? What does the law say about this? And can I do this? I think I wanna do this. Will the law allow me to do that? So that's what I do in the most difficult cases. Thank you so much, Edwin, for your question. Do we have another question? Okay. Um, we're gonna take the gentleman with the I, I am a person. photograph. <laughs> I, need to think of, I, I need to ask a question. Sure. Um, First, say say who you are. Ernesto Morales Ramos, a recent arrival. I'm here since October. Uh, I was recently exposed to the legal family system in Puerto Rico. I got to see people, men in orange suits parading around the courtroom because they didn't pay their pension and so on and so forth, which I think everybody should be taken to see. Um, but I was wondering if the system here in Florida is different in any way in, in terms of, for example, I got to see a woman stand there with two kids in her arms and another one holding on to her, her falda. In court? In court. For a third time, waiting for the ex-husband to show up, and then the judge was said, "Well, uh, let's get him another thirty days, another citation." And da, 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 da. So speed is not a, uh, a shall we say, is the most the most um, emphatic issue in, in in the Puerto Rico legal system. And in general terms, there is a lot of discrimination against women in, in, in the system per se. What is your perception of how it is here? Is it any different? Is it more balanced? Is it more, uh, you know, pro-woman, pro-man, pro, you know, uh, what you find in, in your daily experience? Let me start off with, um, I have to preface that I came back to the family division just recently in January. Okay. 
And so whatever information I'm about to give you is based on what you describe the uh, system to be in, in Puerto Rico versus what I've heard even before I got back uh, the family bench. And I heard it from the practitioners because I wanted to know before I went there, what's your perception of family court? What are the pro I always like to, even before I went even in civil, I asked the practitioners, people who practice, what don't you like that's going on in family court? What is your perception as to what's going on? Is it more favorable to men, women? You know, I, I want to know that because, again, these are things. Rem remember, at the end of the day, perception is a reality. Okay, whether it's true or not, it becomes a reality. So to go back on the one of the issues you mentioned that you have the moms coming in with children. First of all, children are not allowed in the court. I mean, you need permission. You need permission um, if you want a child to speak to the judge. You just cannot bring a child um, into the courtroom in family court. And, and the bailiffs are all trained, and we have a nursery, I forget what floor, where the children go to. But they are not allowed in the courtroom unless, first of all, someone files a motion, and then there is usually a hearing on the motion whether or not the child will be brought in to discuss anything. So that's number one. Um, you talked about the speed. You know, I, I would say when I was in family division six years ago, that was always a complaint that things just don't get moving um, as quickly as they can. But I think there's a number of things going on right now. Um, I know that the Florida legislators have given us guidelines that certain cases should only take so long. And forgive me for not remembering what they are, but I'm part of the pilot program now in family where all these cases are being monitored, meaning from the time of filing a complaint until the end. So a simple case should be rather quickly, like, you know, I, I think they're saying, I don't know if it's 90 or 180 days, I don't recall the numbers, but they're tracking all this. We're going, we're now in an age, you talked about earlier about transparency. We're at an age where transparency is at work. People want to know the numbers and how fast they're going through that. So that is always on the back of my mind when you say that. So, but this is the, the second part to that issue. Then you get attorneys, and I'm thinking some of these cases. I had like a 2016 case, and I'm wondering, you know, what, what's going on here? 2016, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's a rarity, I think, uh, now, but to some extent. You get cases where you've had a rotation of four or five different lawyers. So you know how that works, right? And that can sometimes be a strategy, right? You know, people use changing the lawyers to, oh, I just got on the case. I need time to get. I, listen, I was a lawyer before that. You know, el diablo sabe más por viejo que por diablo. I, I get that. I know all that stuff. Okay. So, you know, you got to maneuver all that when people do that. You got to maneuver when there are discovery issues and all that. So there's this whole balancing um, that we have to do. I like to think that myself and many of the newer judges that, are ro that have rotated into family now, because we did come from civil where we had over 2,000 cases, now in family we have like 500. When you compare 2,000, 500 is nothing. Yeah. And so, but, but, but the difference being this, family cases are more um, work intensive because you're dealing, like the gentleman said, with lives. So you're hearing a lot of testimony about what's been going on with the relationship. There's now a lot of domestic violence that, that may be involved with um, whatever, uh, if it's a dissolution of marriage or paternity action, et cetera. And so, uh, with well, that's you know, thank you for that's honestly, I think that's usually the biggest and hardest to manage because you know you can accept the litigants are the ones that are coming in and being emotional, but sometimes the attorneys, I have to remind them and tell them, look, you're not the one getting divorced, you're not the one going through the domestic uh, violence. I have to tell you, look, take it down a notch because they get very excited and I think they almost become an extension of who they're representing. So the emotion is not to be easily uh, disregarded. The emotions are hard to tackle. We have to deal with that. And you know what, you as a judge, when you have people screaming at you, you know, you have to sort of, I, I, you know, again, I, I just breathe and I'm like, you know what? And, and you start people screaming and I'm like, you know what, you're not gonna do that. There's gonna be respect 
one person speaks and the other. So we set the tone to, to not have that happen. Um, and so the other question for you was whether it's more male yeah, or, I you know, I don't know what to tell you. They're different. Um, you know, years ago, I would hear, I would say in excess of eight, nine years ago, I would hear from practitioners say, oh, it's, it's usually favored towards the woman. And because I've always heard that, you know, I do keep that back in my mind. And I always, you know, I always hope that the decisions I, I make, I mean, hopefully it should be 50-50. Um, that, you know, I'm favoring women 50%, favoring men 50%. Um, because, yeah, you always have to keep that in check, whether you're a male sitting on the bench who's been previously divorced and now adjudicating on, on yeah, we've got a number of those, or, or a female uh, judge, you know, for whatever reasons that may relate. So you always have to keep that in check. I mean, all these biases you do. I'd like to think now we're not as off balance as we were. I think in speaking to practitioners, what I'm hearing is that it's not as bad as it used to be that they know I'd go in, it's more favored towards women. You know, I think it, it, it depends. I think at least now what I'm hearing, it depends. So I hope I answered like all the main questions you asked. <laughs> I think that's why it's important for, I don't think that women are now in this era viewed as victims, largely, in, no, in a large scale. And they're this not. is why you perhaps are seeing that. We're going to take one more question. Luis. No, first, thank you for your time. No, thank you for coming. Well, what you're showing in terms of the scale of justice, and I remember using that when I would do speak to the jurors, that's called in voir dire in criminal. In criminal, it's got to be like this, meaning it's not the 51%. In family court, we're dealing with, you know, family court is not even, a t it's like the best interest of the child. And, you know, and you got to, how do you define that? I mean... There are a lot of different cases out there. What's in the best interest of the child? I've gotten a number of relocation cases. Let me explain what that is. When you have a, a, a party who have divorced or even a paternity action, and now one of the parties, whether it's, let's say it's the woman who has primary uh, custody of the child, now they want to move to California, right? So I have now a hearing about this, whether or not it's going to be in the best interest of the child to move. And now the one, obviously, that will suffer will be dad. Um, and so you have to weigh that. And so the statute lays out a number of criteria that I have to view. And I have to make findings on all these criteria um, in the law and then ultimately determine, will it be in the best interest of the child looking at all the criteria that the law tells me I have to look at and make findings, and then I'm also making finding who do I believe at the end of the day, right? Um, then, however I conclude, then I say, yes, that's in the best interest of the child because this is the analysis that the law may, uh, wants me to make. I've made it, and I happen to believe this person. So that's going to be in the best interest of the child, and this is how I believe, according to the law, um, that the father, let's say in this case, will still have the uh, significant relationship that he is required to have by law with the child, even though the child now will be allowed to be uprooted to maybe Mexico or California, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I don't know if I really answered that in, in that term, but the, the law, depending on what 
specific. I gave you the example of relocation because it's very clear what I need to look at in the analysis. So that's what I would do. Do you think, in your personal opinion, us as Puerto Ricans are uniting enough to educate so that we have less cases in court? Uniting less cases? By, I, I, by associations like ours, okay. we try to educate, okay. empower people, inspire people. Thank you so much for today no, being you. part of our series of, of fireside chats with Puerto Rican champions. You certainly are one. Thank you. Um, I think we need to do more, in, in my opinion, and this is why we exist. Education. And we need platforms in which we collectively put the message out there of how to educate, how to educate your children, how to raise them in the correct way so that in the future, I as a mother feel the responsibility that I don't want my son or my daughter to be the ones in your courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do I set the example, but I talk to them. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we should do collectively. What do you think we, you, we should do collectively to get that message out there? You know, exposing programs like this, um, it's, it's always important. Um, I always avail myself to different communities, and they ask me to speak on different topics. And, you know, you realize people don't know what's available to them, like even within the court system. You know, if they have an issue um, where they can go, we have a self-help program. I mean, and, and people need to know that the information's out there. You just have to, you know, make the information available to them. I mean, anything as simple of as important as, and I remember I've, I've spoken at the Puerto Rican bar, um, the importance of going out and vote. Uh, voting Thank for you. your judges, you know, voting for your judges first and foremost. Uh, don't go blindside and just, you know, pick because the name sounds well. If you don't, if you don't know, if you don't know the individual, don't vote, but educate yourself out there. I mean, it's true with judges, we're really limited. We can't discuss anything legally, but I think um, someone, for example, uh, anyone uh, can educate themselves in terms of the education of the judge. You know, what kind of education does it, does it look like this person has the intellectual ability to, to do the job? Did, do they have the proper education? Have they been out long enough practicing to now want to become a judge? Because I've talked to you about the evolution that happens to one individually. Do they have the maturity? Do I want someone? Are they mature enough to be sitting there and making decisions for me? You know, God forbid all of us will have to be in court, Ho hopefully not as a litigant, maybe as a juror. Um, but let's say you're a litigant, whether it's a civil matter because someone's suing you or you're suing somebody because you slip and fell, right? Or um, unfortunately at a divorce, you want to make sure that the person sitting there has a maturity, the intellectual ability um, to do, um, to follow the law. The other thing you want to make sure too about the individual that's sitting there, whether or not they're involved with the community. Are there an individual that are totally isolated or are they out? Look, I've been involved with the community since I've been, uh, since I got to Miami. You know, my, my passion are uh, children, so I've been involved with uh, big brothers, uh, big sisters um, in over 10, 15 years. I now my passion is also the homeless. I'm involved with the homeless. And, you know, I take and during uh, the Mother's Day and at least twice a year, you know, I feed the homeless. You, you know, you want somebody that's out there in the community that doesn't live in an ivory tower that can relate to everybody in their community. And that's incredibly important because, you know what, our job is a lonely job. Once you're there, and I'll, let me explain what, what I mean by that. It's lonely because when I start hearing cases, I can't talk to anybody about my cases except my interns and, and maybe my other colleagues, and that's it. And we're limited. We can't talk about our cases. So it's a good thing, and I mean, that's why I enjoy um, going out and, you know, mentoring and getting involved with my, the homeless um, because it just keeps me away from that. And plus, I feel like I want to give back. So, you, you know, you want to make sure that whoever's sitting there making decisions um, 
for you and your case, your company, you know, that they're also relatable and they know what everyone is going through, the different communities. For me, I think that's important. Well, thank you so much um, for today and for your service. We're thank very you. proud to have you as part of our, uh, as our community. And uh, lastly, today is July 25th, a day in which we com commemorate the, the status of our beloved island. Do you feel Puerto Rico should be the 51st state? <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is one of those things, what my personal opinion, you know, obviously I, I grew up in a household that I've heard this, I know the full argument. And plus, um, I also sat as a moot court judge uh, during the Puerto Rican bar that they actually litigated this issue, um, whether it should be a state or not. So I'm very well versed on that. And all I can tell you is this, because I don't want to be put in a position that should uh, an issue like this come before me, I would not want to be recused. And so I would just tell you, it suffice to say this, that um, I'm going to follow the law, whatever the law happens to be at that point in time. I'm not oblivious to the issue. I, I believe I'm well versed on it. And I forgot the gentleman that I know that has written uh, quite a bit on that. But yeah, I mean, whatever the law happens to be, um, should that issue come before me, I'm going to follow whatever the law is. And that's all I can say at this point. Thank you so much. Um, we are, we have prepared something very beautiful for you. I, I would like for Hector to come in. And say a few words that he wanted to say. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> and you're spending it here? Stop it. Yeah, I now have to go work at another event. Thank you so very much, George, for your time, for being here. Thank you, Elena. Elena did a phenomenal job. Yeah, Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I want to hold up. I can't believe you have a 12 year old. Uh, oh, perfect. Do you want me to come down? Or? Yes. Oh, good, good. Oh, sure, sure. So we, we have an order.